Well, happy Christmas, everyone. Welcome to Hope Church, especially uh, if you're visiting with us today. It's great to have you with us. Well, how do you combine Christmas with uh, my creation ministry? Well, I thought, well, if you think back to the Garden of Eden, what did Adam say before the day before Christmas? He said, it's Christmas Eve. And she said, no, it's the next day, right? Um, the other one I liked was this. Uh, how do you know energy prices are going up a lot? Dad won't even let you open the windows on your advent calendar. That one that's uh, close to my heart. There you go. Well, we do have our windows open in church. Uh, this year we can sing. Um, that's good, isn't it, on Christmas Day? We can sing as we meet. We can sing without our masks on as we meet. And so let's start with that and begin with uh, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. And um, we we get to sing all four verses here, because I think the fourth verse is the best. And you can see here, you did have Christmas in the Garden of Eden, because you had that promise of the coming of Jesus' birth made even there to Adam and Eve in the Garden. Rise the woman's conquering seed. That's the promise made in the Garden of Eden on the very day that sin entered the world. So let's stand and sing Heart the Herald. down. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you that we can sing this morning, and we thank you that we can sing of such 
really mind-boggling and inexpressible truth, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Lord, we cannot understand these things, but we praise you that they are true. We pray, we praise you that your Son, the Son of God, was born as Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world. We thank you that he has come into this world. We thank you he lived that perfect life. We thank you that he went to the cross for our sin, and we thank you that he is risen from the dead. He is alive forevermore, still as a human being in glory today. We praise you that he is our Saviour, and we praise you that, that he is the one that has intervened in our world, who has dealt with our sin. We are the ones who are guilty, and yet you are the one who has brought about redemption. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that in the midst of everything today, that we would see the, truly the glory that is found in the Lord Jesus. May he be born in us today. May we know what it is to be born again through him. Heavenly Father, work in us today. Speak to us afresh, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to have two readings this morning. Um, two weeks ago, Simon was uh, talking about what happened to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And we're going to pick up our reading this morning in, in the midst of that account of when uh, he was spoken to by the angel Gabriel in the temple, and there's a sort of reason why I'm picking up sort of halfway through this account here. So, Luke chapter 1 from verse 19. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Well, let's come and sing a uh, second time this morning. Um, this is uh, part of the, uh, we're singing here about part of the, uh, the account of Jesus' birth that we're not going to be covering in our readings this morning as uh, the angels visit the shepherds. But let's uh, stand, this, stand and sing this together. Go tell it on the mountain. is 
Well, I normally try and avoid uh, drawing out uh, too many lessons out of Christmas presents. And I was, um, I was told by my family this morning I somehow had to get Nessie here into um, what I was saying this morning, and I'm still struggling on that one, so you'll have to, you'll have to work that one out. But you, the one lesson you can learn, though, is this. Do be careful what you say after a service. Uh, a few weeks ago, I'm... I was uh, telling people how uh, Bagpuss was an absolute nightmare, um, why it suddenly became a craze for people to have Bagpuss pencil cases and things uh, some years ago I've never understood. And uh, look what I was given for Christmas uh, today. Um, I think actually the reason I'm a bit anti-Bagpuss is I was terrified of the woodpecker in it. So, um, but there we go. But um, what I was going to do we'll show you something else. Now, you're not meant to talk about your kids, so that's okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the cat, uh, our cat, Hagrid. And uh, on this one, there is actually a connection with what we're going to be doing in the service tomorrow. Now, here's, uh, here's Hagrid. Um, and you can see there, he's in the bath. Hagrid takes very little interest in me normally, but when he wants a drink, he really hassles me. And he, he just follows you around, he gets under your feet, he meows like anything, and he insists, basically, I go into the bathroom and I turn the tap on so he can drink from the tap. He, he, he won't drink from a bowl of water, he has to go and drink from a tap like this. And then, you, of course, you have to then wait for him to finish to be able to turn the tap off so that you don't have a massive water bill uh, at the end of the year, you see? N connection there with what I said at the start, um, the heating, the water, this is the sort of thing you have to worry about um, as parents. So, what have we done to uh, help Hagrid out and to perhaps help me out? This is why I was keen to get him a present, because it helps me out. We have, look at this. This is a cat fountain. Let me see if this works. Come on. See, look at that. See? So, continuous supply of water. I haven't actually seen him doing anything with this yet. I'm not sure we've have we tested it out. No, he hasn't. He's, he's probably headed off because he knew we had, had this coming. <laughs> so, um, a fountain. And let's hope this, uh, this sorts out Hagrid's uh, problem of needing me to turn the tap on. The great thing about a fountain is that the water just keeps on flowing. It just, just keeps going. And it's a picture that um, many of the Puritans used, actually, as a picture of, of what God is like, that of God's life, of God's love, that it's just this endless fountain. God never had a beginning. He'll never have an end. And if you like, he's always giving out. Water gives us life, doesn't it? And... God is the one who is constantly pouring out life. He's not someone that's holding everything into himself. He's someone that's pouring out love to all he has made. And it never runs out. That's why Jesus talks about living water that is like eternal life. He talks to the Samaritan woman about springs of, of, of living water welling up to eternal life. And I think that's a beautiful picture of what God is like, what his love is like, and why he is someone inexhaustible, and we can never have, we can never sort of take, you can never take from God, because he's always, always giving. Now, of course, Hagrid doesn't need that, but we do. Um, but maybe when we think of uh, the cats there having their drink, where do we go? We go to Jesus Christ, because he is the fountain of life. Okay, let's have another reading. So we're picking up from, from where we left off there in Luke, from uh, verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? 
As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and to his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Let's come again to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the Mighty One. You are the Mighty One who cares for the little people. Thank you for how Mary could proclaim there how you had uh, come to her in her in her lowest state. We thank you that she could sing of how you are the one who overturns the powers of this world. You are the one who brings justice. And Lord, we know that the full measure of that will not be seen till Jesus comes again. But we thank you that even now you are at work to bring justice, to bring down the proud, to raise up the humble. And we want to pray for those in need in our world today. People who not only will not have any presence, they won't have any food people who are hungry, people who are displaced from their homes, people in the midst of war, people facing horrendous poverty, people who have been um, abused and have been um, trafficked and, and, and enslaved by others. Heavenly Father, this evil in our world, we pray, Father, for you to be at work to bring justice, to bring ways where some of those needs can be met. We want to pray, Father, for the persecuted. We think of your people who are in prison today, people who are away from their families, others who are living in fear, maybe meeting in fear this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that your persecuted people would know that they are precious in your sight, that you would give them uh, courage, give them encouragement, give them that knowledge of your closeness and of your protection. And Father, we pray for our own fellowship. We pray for those who are ill. We pray for those who are having to isolate. We pray for those who are sad, for those who grieve today, who feel the loss of loved ones, who know loneliness. Our Heavenly Father, we pray in all these different needs that it would be the Lord Jesus who is the one who meets those needs, that we would find comfort in God, our Savior. We pray, Father, for the hope of the gospel to be increasingly brought into this world. Yes, in some of those, in those sort of war-torn places, those places where people are hungry, we pray, Father, that you would uh, give them hope by bringing them hope for something that is more than just for this life. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for your gospel, that this would be bearing fruit across the world, and indeed even in our own land even in all that we've been shaken by in the last 18 months, our Heavenly Father, we pray that that would not cause a even further turning away from you, but rather a turning to you, a humbling before you to see our weakness, to see our need, to see our guilt, 
and to run to a saviour who is more than sufficient to deal with our sin and with every problem. Heavenly Father, have mercy, we pray, in our world and make us thankful for all the blessings that you have given to us. Make us generous. Make us uh, people that will do what we can in our situation in, with the means that we have to show your love and to bring help and care into this world. So, Father, help us now and speak to us, we pray, from your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing once more uh, this um, this, uh, sort of modernized version of um, something Charles Wesley wrote. Glory be to God on high. Let peace on earth descend. God comes down before our eyes to Bethlehem. The miracle of the incarnation. Let's let's stand and sing. sit down. <clears throat> well, what do you talk about on a Christmas Day service? In past years, we've covered Christmassy topics like shopping and TV, food, even gorillas. Yes, that was in 2018. Um, This year, I thought feminism would be an obvious subject for Christmas Day. Because as you read the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth, it's a feminist manifesto. You know, forget the female eunuch and Jermaine Greer and anything and all the stuff written since. Luke and Matthew got there first. We just think that Zechariah, he's struck dumb. There's no mansplaining there, is there? Joseph is silent. If you read the accounts, you never have any words from Joseph. And in fact, the most unbelievable part of the whole, whole, um, the whole account is the fact that there were three wise men. This is a card that uh, appears in our kitchen. You can see we're outnumbered at home. But more seriously, the central miracle in this whole account is the virgin birth, or perhaps more accurately, the virgin conception. When you think about it, that beats anything that secular feminism offers. Here is a baby with no man involved. It's incredible. 
And it's not just that, because women are center stage in this whole account of Jesus' birth, just as they are actually at his cross and resurrection. It's the women who are center stage there. It is Mary who is told first of Jesus' conception, not Joseph. And unlike Joseph, Mary has a voice. We have her words, we have her perspective, we even have her song. You know, we talk about giving the powerless people a voice. Well, Mary has a voice here, just like many other women in the Bible. And you know, what she says puts her in a better light than, for example, Zechariah. Simon explained this a couple of weeks ago, that um, despite their responses sounding similar to what the angel was telling them, this incredible message, Zechariah responds with unbelief whereas Mary responds with faith. Mary, we're told, pondered these things in our heart after the shepherds had arrived. It's interesting, we're told that Mary did that. We're not told Joseph did. The focus is on Mary. And it's a pattern we actually find repeated as you go on through the Gospels. The women are often quicker to get it, if you like. They often show far greater theological understanding than the men. The feminism here, though, is a little different to the feminist doctrine offered today. Because, you know, the greatest way that Mary is honoured is not by quotas or token gestures or even this awful dullness of sameness, which basically is the approach today. Everyone has to be the same. How dull, how boring. Mary is honoured in this, in her motherhood. What could be more feminist than that? And yet the irony is that motherhood is is actually a topic that feminism in all its different waves massively struggles to handle. They don't know what to do with it. It's this thing that is is, um, so much associated with being a woman and yet it's something that's almost an embarrassment in feminism. There's some work for someone to do there. And here's another contemporary application. You need to be female, physically, to be a mother. Strange to have to say that, isn't it? But, you know, would Mary have realized that she is the answer to transgender ideology in the 21st century? But it's it's so straightforward, isn't it? Mary is, is the perfect answer to that. Mary could not have enjoyed this privilege had she only identified as female. See, it's amazing what application you get out of the Christmas accounts. But what is it that this honor, this privilege that she enjoyed? Well, let me put it like this. Christmas is a time for hospitality, making a home for someone. Well, carrying a baby is the greatest act of hospitality possible. Mary's womb was a home, giving hospitality to the Son of God. The Son of God who made the universe, who upholds the universe. That same Son of God is dependent upon Mary. She grows in her womb. He needed her milk. She needed real breasts for that. The Son of God was dependent upon her. The very entry of the Son of God into this world was dependent on a woman, on Mary. What greater honor could there be than that? And in fact, it depended on a lot of women. As you look back at the family line of Jesus... As you look back at all those names at the start of Matthew's Gospel, you will find, very unusually, four women mentioned. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Great Christmas activity. Go and read what they did in the Old Testament. But what's interesting about each of those four women, all very different, but they each showed massive initiative and actually great power in altering the course of history. 
Bathsheba, for example, it was her intervention, it was her initiative that ensured that the royal line went through Solomon. She altered the course of history. So the history of, that leads to Jesus' birth depends on these and other women. It goes right back to the promise, again, made to a woman in Genesis 3.15, to Eve. The very day sin enters the world, God promises that the offspring of the woman would be a saviour. Or in the words of Isaiah, a virgin will conceive. This surely is feminism plus, feminism on steroids or on estrogen or something. We, we sell out far too easily as Christians. We've got a far better account. Stuff this stuff we're told in the world around us that people make out is so revolutionary and exciting and everything else. It's absolute rubbish. What you have here in, in, the, in what God has done is far better than anything else we're offered. And just two lessons very quickly from this. One, the honour of motherhood. That's something worth stressing, isn't it, at Christmas? Never ever say, I'm only a mother, or see motherhood as some sort of inconvenient interruption to the real business of life, of your work and career. There will be no human race without mothers. And in fact, there's no future for, for our country without mothers. Our, our population is, is de in decline. We need mothers. And of course, without... Um, Without these mothers, the crucial thing here is there would be no saviour born. So the honour of motherhood, but secondly, the humanity of Jesus. You know, we sing in, in Once in Royal, he was little, weak, and helpless. He really was. That is really true. He was dependent on his mother. And in fact, it wasn't something just at the start. We'd read that Jesus was dependent on the ministry of women throughout his own ministry. Read on there in, in Luke chapter 8, talks about the women that, that assisted and helped him in his ministry. He was dependent on women all his life. But, maybe you're thinking this is all very well, but it's a bit insensitive. I'm single. I'm not able to have children. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm a man. Do all of these, does this all sort of mean I'm some sort of lesser person? Well, not if we understand who Jesus is and why he came. And to help us in this, I'm gonna, I need you to help me on this, okay? We're, we're going to go back to some stuff we read at the carol service last week from Matthew's Gospel. And as I read these verses, I want you to tell me what is the, what is the repeated uh, phrase in each, in each, in each verse? And it's, and it's a clue. It's not get up, okay? Um, that does appear all the way through it, but that isn't the one I'm after. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. What's the repeated phrase? Yeah. The child and his mother. Do you know how many times that came up there? Four times, yeah. And actually there's, there's another one in, in the verses before. It's a bit of an odd order, isn't it? Child and his mother. And yet Matthew keeps repeating this as if this is significant. The child comes first. You see, actually, neither Mary or Joseph are center stage here. Jesus is the one who is center stage, even as a baby. You see, we've seen how Jesus is dependent on Mary. And yet Mary is dependent on the person in her womb, in her arms. The person in her womb, the person that she is holding, is the Son of God who made her, who made the whole universe, and in fact is the one who is giving her every heartbeat, every breath, 
that she takes. Work that out. That's why I say that the, the, the incarnation is the greatest miracle there has ever been. It's mind-boggling. How do you work that out? How can that be? But that is the truth that is being proclaimed here. Jesus is also her saviour. What does she say in her song? My spirit rejoices in God my saviour. Now, I doubt she fully grasped it fully at this point. But what, in the end, she is saying is that the God who is her saviour is the same person who is growing in her womb. This is why Elizabeth says, you know, blessed are you among women. This is what what gives Mary such a special honour. It's not simply because she's a mother, it's because of who this particular baby is. And the whole point is the baby that she bears is for our blessing too, whether you're single or childless or even a man. You see, we all need a saviour, whether you're a man or a woman, single, married, parent or child. Our problem is not ultimately some battle between the sexes or between rich and poor or any other grouping we want to think of. Our battle is actually with God. That's the conflict. That's the desire to go our own way, to be independent of our maker. And it is that battle, that conflict, that fuels every other conflict. And it's a conflict we're in from birth. Think of this. Every child adds sin to the world. When you have a child, you're bringing in someone who is going to bring in more sin into the world. Adds to the problem. Except Jesus. He was different to every other child. You see, this saviour that was sent was not some sort of alpha male. That is, someone bullying, aggressive, throwing their weight around. Nor was he some sort of wimp who wouldn't stand up for anything and was scared to offend anyone. Nor was he some sort of not really properly human person, some sort of Superman superhero. At one level, he was someone very ordinary. He grew up like other children. He had to learn. Think of this. He learned his trade as a carpenter, not by some sort of special divine infusion, just zapped one day and suddenly was a, you know, a brilliant carpenter. He learned it like anyone else from his dad. He learned it from Joseph. Imagine that. Imagine, talked about Mary's privilege. Well, imagine Joseph's privilege. Here he was teaching the Son of God how to make things. I mean, that's quite something, isn't it? That's what I was saying in the carol service. You know, what, what if, if, if Joseph hadn't obeyed God, hadn't married Mary? What would he have missed out on? But what was different about Jesus is that he was sinless. He perfectly obeyed his Father in heaven. He's someone that didn't stand on his rights. He humbled himself as a servant. Not as some sort of dishcloth with no backbone, but as a servant with such depth of love that he went to the cross, that he suffered hell for his enemies. That is real manhood. So his death is the answer to our failure to be the man, the woman, the single person, the married person, the parent, the child that God made us to be. True manhood, true womanhood is found in finding forgiveness in this Savior and in following him. It's about this child coming first. You see, it was Jesus that governed the course of Mary and Joseph's marriage, their life, where they lived, everything about them, their whole family life. It was totally turned upside down because Jesus was their child. He was more important than anything. And while he was in that family, he had brothers and sisters. I mean... Work that out. Think of that. Who didn't believe in him. Think of that too. 
if we're sometimes discouraged, Jesus had brothers and sisters who didn't believe in him, not till after his resurrection. Because Jesus, what, he, what was he doing? He was coming not to perpetuate that family, but to make a new family. Someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. So Jesus, of course, is going to say, well, of course, let me go, let me go, and, go, go and meet them. They're, 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 they're number one. They've got to come first. No, he doesn't say that. He says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Well, that's pretty rude, isn't it, Jesus? That's not, surely you shouldn't be be saying things like that. But he says this, pointing to his disciples, he said, "Here here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus is making a new family. Jesus was single. Jesus had no children. Yet through his death, he gives life to a great multitude, to the biggest family on earth, to God's children, people born again through trusting in, being joined to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. As John puts it at the start of his gospel, yet to all who received him, that is Jesus Christ, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Everything changes with the coming of Jesus. Before he was born, every mother could wonder, is my child going to be the saviour? Is my child going to be the saviour promised to Eve, or maybe an ancestor of this saviour? That's why the Bible records all these names, these lines of descent. It really mattered. But after Jesus, have you ever noticed, there's no more genealogies, there's no more lists of names. You don't need them anymore, because the saviour has been born. So now the family that you're born into is less important. Which in some ways is quite fortunate, isn't it? That's not something you can change. You don't choose your family. But everyone, and we're going to see this again tomorrow, has the opportunity to be born again into the family of the church. People who have trusted Christ, received Christ into their lives. It's that great line in, that, in a little town of Bethlehem, be born in us today. It's a great description of being a Christian. Christ born in you. And it is something that is open to you, whatever you've done, whatever your background, whether male or female, rich or poor, single or married. You get to join God's family. So the church of God's people is not like a family. It's not some sort of metaphor, oh, the church is like a family. No, no, no. It's the real family. If you like, our human families are the sort of metaphor of the real family of the church. You see, our physical families are for this life. They are temporary. God's family is eternal. It's forever. I wonder how that makes you feel. That sounds scary. The church is the thing that's eternal, not our human families. It's a bit like what Jesus says about marriage when he says there is no marriage in heaven. When he is saying that, he is not saying there's something, here's the sort of small print, there's something sort of deficient or missing in heaven, there's something a bit second best. He is saying that what we will experience there is something that supersedes human marriage. It's, in fact, what every human marriage should point to, to Christ and his church, his bride. And in the same way, this heavenly family, the church, is not some sort of second best. It's the greatest family we could ever be part of. With Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as our brother, 
In him we know God as our Father. There is no greater family, no greater privilege. So I don't know who you will be with today. Families, friends, or whatever else. But this, this offer is, is from Jesus Christ himself to join his family by trusting in him. What better way to celebrate Christmas and indeed every day than to be part of his family? Let's finish with a final carol. Once in royal David's city, we see here in verses uh, 4 and 5, he says here about he leads his children on to the place where he is gone. There his children gather round, bright like stars with glory crowned. These are the people that are joined to Jesus Christ, who have trusted in him, who are part of his family. So let's stand and sing, Once in royal David's city. Please sit down. Let's close in prayer. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for how we can testify of where we are Jesus' offspring in that sense, that we are the fruit of his sacrifice, that he has given his life to us. Heavenly Father, may we see the great, just what a privilege that is, 
to be joined to this Saviour, to know him, to have uh, a secure future. Lord, in all the uncertainty, in all the dangers, in all that would make us anxious, we thank you that we have and can know this Saviour. And we pray, Father, that that would be the testimony of everyone here today. It would be the testimony of all in our families, others who are not gathered here with us maybe today. We pray, Father, that we would see the fruit of this gospel, that we would see you turning lives around. We would see you saving whole families and working amongst us in a new way that the, Jesus would see the fruit of his work on the cross. Thank you that he came. Thank you that he has gone to such lengths to save us. And we pray, Father, that we would trust in him today. For we ask this in his name. Amen.